Uh, dear all, uh, welcome to this uh, Afran online webinar. My name is Mohammed Abdel Gawad. I'm a nephrologist from Egypt. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce today one of the most eminent professors of nephrology uh, in Egypt and Africa, Professor Dr. Hisham Said. Dr. Hisham is professor of nephrology in Ayn Shams University, Egypt. He also is the head uh, of nephrology department at ASUSH Hospital, and he is the vice president of ESNT and also the chair of hemodialysis chapter in Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Transplantation. Oh, Regarding God. Africa, he is uh, the chair of the Afran hemodialysis chapter. He is the chief consultant of R&D hemodialysis membranes and optimization, contributors in many other activities as the Global Kidney Academy, he was one of the authors or editors of Hemodialysis uh, Guidelines of Egypt, senior consultant of Egypt at Ministry of Health Dialysis Committee, uh, one of the Egyptian Hemodialysis COVID-19 uh, COVID kidney disease consultants. And finally, he has a lot of researches in hemodialysis, hemodifiltration, acute kidney injury, and the blood purifications. Professor Hisham presented before uh, a lecture about basics of hemodialysis. We called it Basics of Hemodialysis Part 1. Today, you will find this lecture on the YouTube channel of a friend. Today, he will present the second part, of the basics of uh, hemodialysis. Uh, please, uh, Professor Hisham. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gawad, and uh, dear all, hopefully that uh, we have uh, uh, Ramadan Mubarak. I will share my talk today in the second part of the hemodialysis principles, and this is the basics of hemodialysis to understand the physics as well the compartmentalizations and solid removal ultrafiltration for dialysis. And I think this is importantly for the better management. We'll go through later on by more in depth of the clinician that uh, information should be known well. However, at the moment, the basic principles of dialysis should be kept uh, in all information uh, as well uh, for the patients as well uh, in the uh, physician, nurses, the techniques of dialysis and the uh, removal of both the fluids and the solids. So this is uh, in part one, we discuss the characteristics of hemodialysis is the diffusion, which means that movement of solids by the concentration gradients. Today, we will discuss the convection, the second method of solid removal, ultrafiltration and fluid removal with stressing on the pack filtration, the sieving coefficient, curve of the dialyzer membrane, the plasma refilling grate, and potassium and phosphorus as a marker of different compartmentalizations. And finally, we will end to the highlight of uh, how to choose a dialyzer, but this part will be mainly in the third part. Diffusion, as discussed before, is like a T-PAG effect. Movement of the solids from the blood to the dialysate through a concentration gradient. Typically, like a T-PAG, if you put a T-PAG with higher concentration of a T into a water, the solids move from the T-PAG the T to the water, which is the dialysate. And this is particularly important. The diffusion is for the small solids like urea, like potassium, mainly removed by diffusion. However, convection, which is a hallmark of the high flux dialysis and the hemodiafiltration, is the movement of larger solutes associated with movement of water, which is obligatory fluid removal. Removing more of fluids drags more solids to be removed. And this typically is the method of hemodiafiltration and the high flux dialysis. And the whole marker of that is the PETA2 microglobulin. So the convection principle, meaning that increasing the ultrafiltration of the patients in hemodiafiltration technique or in high flux of dialysis drags 
more of the middle molecules through a pressure gradient. That's again, it is a diffusion gradient or concentration gradient. Here's a convection depending on the ultrafiltration largely. Provided that the dialyzer membranes permit removal of larger molecules. So in convection, meaning that removing more of waters, having more of solids inside and out to the dialysate site. And this is particular by increasing the transmembrane pressure over the dialyzer membrane. In hemodial filtration, if you have some experiences in that in your country, hemodial filtration could be as a slow, like in CRRT, in particular, our interest was in COVID-19 in the ICU and in patient with sepsis, or online hemodial filtration, meaning that a shorter dialysis session with larger convection volume. And this will be on more details on the section of hemodial filtration after finalizing the basic principles. The hallmark of hemodial filtration and convection is removal of larger molecules. We have high flux dialysis. We have both the process, diffusion, and convection. And we have hemodial filtration. Also, we have a diffusion because you have a dialysate flow with an augmented convection, higher than in high flux. So the membrane cr criteria is important because if you look to the inside with the dialyzer membrane facing the porosity of the dialysis membranes to the blood cells, the smaller solids removed by diffusion, again, it's concentration, gradient, while larger molecules needing more pressure to be removed from the tiny holes inside the dialysis membrane, and is increased by removal as well of fluids. So this is the convection criteria. While the deposited part of the plasma proteins inside the dialysis membrane should be considered as a limiting factor. So one of the tricks in hemodial filtration is to use dialysis membranes with lower capacity of absorption of the dialysis membranes to be more healthy. So the in convection basically is the movement of molecules through a semi-permeable dialysis membrane associated with fluid being removed during ultrafiltration. The convective transport is independent of solid concentration gradient against that the diffusion. Convection is the dragging of the solids from the blood side to the dialysis side by water removal. Movement increased, so it is a linear correlation between how much fluid removed and how much molecules are also removed. The inside the dialysis fibers depending on the blood flow, positive towards the dialysate, and negative pressure from the dialysate side toward as well to the dialysate. So the direction is one way from inside to outside. Using low flux towards the diffusion, then going up towards High flux dialysis and the hemodial filtration is the maximum convection volume you can achieve. 
Here is the low flux, here is the high flux, and here is the hemodia filtration. We have online hemodia filtration and high flux dialysis. This is a basic nowadays for uh, efficient dialysis. You can find that these solids removed beyond as well beta 2 microglobulin, but still before albumin, because albumin loss is not uh, important to know that it should not exceed three gram per session. So this area of removal of solids of beta 2 microglobulin, cytokines, other molecules, but stop before the album. So the convection is increased by increasing volume of water removal, increasing the removal, increased by increasing the ultrafiltration. This is typically the 23 liters removed during post-dilutional hemodiafiltration. Considering phosphate diffusion versus convection, time or flux. So for example, phosphate is not a large molecule. However, it's mainly by diffusion process, convection increased the removal. However, the only way to remove maximally the phosphate is by extended hemodialysis more than five hours, nocturnal hemodialysis, post-dilutional hemodiafiltration is a little bit higher than in dialysis, uh, low flux or high flux, because this is a compartmental effect. The majority of the state is in outside the blood compartment. So you need more time rather than permeability. Higher conviction with higher toxin removal, you can achieve the kappa lambda even, which is around uh, 45,000 removal by hemodiafiltration technique, medium cut off and high cut off hemodialysis. You never combine hemodiafiltration by membranes like medium cut off or high cut off. Why? Because albumin will exceed seven to 10 grams or even more than 20 grams by high cut off membranes. So never to combine hemodiafiltration with medium cut off or high cut off hemodialysis membranes. So increasing the convection volume, the sequel will be increasing in the transmembrane pressure, may affect the membrane deposition. Hemodialysis machine usually has a feedback control. If there is a membrane fouling or membrane deposition of proteins, decreasing automatically the ultrafiltration, which is called back filtration and will come back in a second. Reaching the target, the convection volume, you can achieve that by increasing dialyzer surface area, filtration fraction, or increasing the time, higher blood flow rate in uh, vascular axis. So the transmembrane pressure applied to the dialysis membrane, depending on the target of ultrafiltration, it is minimal in high flux, but it's very high in hemodia filtration. This is called the transmembrane pressure. And it is on one way towards the dialysis. So the players for the uremic toxins that lead to our schedule of dialysis technique should obey four steps. For any uremic toxin that's called the uremic toxin should be chemically identified their levels in uremic patients are higher than normal persons, should be clearly identified as a cause of a disease, link it. For example, we can say that parathyroid hormone is a toxin because it leads to definite exact disease in the bone and the others. 
as well as potassium is a toxin, beta-2 microglobulin is a toxin, because all of them are linked to a specific disease. And the finally, our goal is that disease should be improved by their removal rate on dialysis. For example, a patient with higher beta-2 microglobulin removal by hemodial filtration or high flux dialysis should improve the beta-2 microglobulin amyloidosis and the position in the synovium. And here is the, our score of dialysis. Low flux is now being dying as a dialysis membrane. We should not have low flux anymore. We can use high flux, super flux, hemodial filtration, or lastly, the medium cutoff. Considering the third part of the basics of mechanism of dialyzer, dialysate, and the plug compartment interaction is the ultrafiltration. Meaning of ultrafiltration is the movement of water fluids across a semi-dialysis membrane. It depending on the dialyzer, KOF, for example, low flux is around 10, however, high flux may reach 80. The movement of that is called ultrafiltration and ultrafiltration movement of the blood towards the end of the dialyzer, giving the water or fluids outside the dialyzer sites. It should be considered that limited ultrafiltration should be considered for patient with instability or in patient with cardiac disorders. We will uh, highlight that soon and should not exceed around 10 milli per kg per hour. The second part is called back filtration, and the, it is again, it's the ultrafiltration, meaning that movement of fluids from the dilated side to the blood side. And it is typically present in patients with high flux dialysis. Why? Because if you put, for example, one liter ultrafiltration per session, the dialyzer porosity and ultrafiltration is very high, may be removed from the patient six or seven liters. However, the machine calculates that and return it back fluids from the dialysis to the blood during the four hours. So the net ultrafiltration would be only one liter, and it's called a pack filtration. So ultrafiltration movement of fluids from the blood to the outside, while pack filtration is movement of fluids from the dialysis to the blood side, and typically around six to eight liters in patients on high flux. That's why we have to look carefully for the dialysis purification in patients going on high flux dialysis. This is a pack filtration uh, uh, principle. One of the important issues is the plasma refilling rate. What is the plasma refilling rate? You remove the water from the plug. However, the interstitium and cells is still has a lot of fluids inside. And so the plasma should refill the plot side by extra volume of fluids from the interstitium. And this takes time and may induce, if delayed, the plasma refilling induce intradilytic hypotension. One of the mechanisms of improvement of intradilytic hypotension is to use cold dialysate because it maintains the vasoconstriction and decreasing the venous capacitance. Lower dialysate temperature in hemodialysis 
Is this a cool idea? Yes, we have experience with that. However, sometimes it may induce under dialysis and volume expansion, recurrent and cumulative ischemic insult to multiple organs, lower nitric oxide production during hemodialysis. In all intradiuretic hypotension is markedly improved by using one degree even of cooler dialysis. Going to the back to the physiology and the cardiology, when the patient has an extra load, this affects negatively the heart. The excess volume overload will lead to lower cardiac output and difficult ultrafiltration rate due to overstretch. So we have to evaluate volume status regularly. Decreasing in the cardiac function by increasing in the end of diastolic volume, starting forces. So patient with extra volume or excessive volume may experience lower cardiac output that complicate the process of dialysis. Subsequently, we have to reach the target of the dry weight very smoothly. Otherwise, myocardial ischemia can be happened. And this is called the D-shaped heart, meaning compression of the left ventricle by the expanded volume of the systemic circulation of the right ventricle. And it's called the D-shaped heart in patient with excess intravascular volume. So progressive volume overload induce right ventricular overload, impair left ventricular contraction, decrease cardiac output, and induce intradialytic hypotension. So this is a D-shaped heart in ischemia. One of the very important items is the plasma refilling. Plasma volume around three liters. Blood volume drops by 5 to 20% because plasma refilling from the intracellular, interstitial fluid compartment, and the splanking and the cutaneous circulation. Looking to the splanking, we did not always recommend that patients eating a lot during dialysis. We always recommend just eating. A juices or something like that to prevent hypoglycemia. But if you have a heavy meal, the splanking blood flow will increase and this entirely induce intradiuretic hypotension. So be carefully on that. Don't permit food except very small snacks on hemodialysis. Ultrafiltration excess leading to increase in plasma and cotic pressure, drop in capillary hydrostatic pressure, postmobilized fluids from the extravascular space, plasma volume falls depending on relative ultrafiltration and the plasma referring rate. Very variable between patients and patients, higher risk of hypotension is low protein uh, uh, available, hypotensive episodes are common when extra or intravascular flow chest at a rate of below four milli millimeter mercury per minute. So poor plasma refilling, commonly in diabetics because there is autonomic neuropathy or due to drugs that induce vasodilatation, Eating on dialysis, increasing the splanking blood flow, increasing the production 
of gastric fluids. What is the curve of plasma? Referring. Most of the modern hemodialysis machine using right now the blood volume monitoring system. The relative blood volume is measured by changes in the hematocrit in the blood tubings during hemodialysis. At a specific point where the hematocrit inside the, the blood tubing system increased will alarm the machine that excessive ultrafiltration is applied. Subsequently, the machine automatically stops ultrafiltration for the risk of more remo concentration, and this for sure will induce intradiuretic hypotension. Improper Plasma refilling rate, for example, in patient with low serum albumin, we can say that the plasma refilling rate is lower than normal. Again, to the flux and the solid permeability, using high flux dialysis, super flux, or medium cut off, all this category of the dialysis membrane can remove a lot of molecules, bigger molecules than in low flux, with very high ultrafiltration capacity. So we can use high flux, super flux in hemodial filtration, but never to use medium cut off or high cut off in such procedures because of the albumin loss. So ultrafiltration rate to the patient, usually around or below 10 milli per kg per hour. Plasma refilling usually in normal is around two to six only milli per kg per hour. Maximum 10 milli per kg per hour. There is a lag period. You remove fluids from the plot, but the plasma refilling will delay 30 minutes, and sometimes you can have intradiuretic hypotension during the first 30 minutes of dialysis. Increasing dialysis sodium is a bad idea because it's increasing the osmosis, finally, thirst or higher intradiuretic weight gain. Cooler dialysis will maintain the vascular tool will lower the capillary hydrostatic pressure and venous capacitance and more cardiovascular stability. Low serum albumin in patients with malnutrition will induce low plasma oncotic pressure, lower plasma refill, and inaccessible water removal. So cool dialysis is mandatory in all cases. So this needed to refill from the plasma to the blood side to be removed from the blood, and this called the plasma refilling rate. It is usually in the range of two to six milli per kg per hour. There is a lag period during the 30 minutes, and this first 30 minutes where movement of fluids does not compensate it by refilling of fluids from the interstitium. However, after that, it could uh, be refilling in the rate of up to uh, usually around 600 milli uh, per hour. Coming now to one important issue for the dialysis circuit is the recirculation. We all know that arteriovenous uh, cycle uh, recirculation, but I would stress here on a long loop recirculation, which is the cardiopulmonary recirculation within the cardiovascular system. Vascular axis recirculation, common in catheters 
and in proximal fistula with the stenosis. And this is, could be calculated by different techniques. Cardiopulmonary circulation, meaning that not only the blood returns back to the heart to be recycled to the tissue, to nourish the tissue again, and to remove toxins from the tissue before going to the dialyzer. Very high vascular access flow, more than 30% of the cardiac output carries the risk of heart failure. So usually the arterial venous fistula is exceeding the 30% of cardiac output. The heart overload, volume overload state would induce cardiac problems. The cardiopulmonary recirculation meaning that if you have a dialyzer here and the blood return should go to the heart, return it to the systemic circulation to carry toxins before going back to the dialyzer. However, the cardiopulmonary circulation due to very high flow of the arteriovenous fistula, making the heart push the blood back again to the dialyzer immediately without going to the systemic circulation. The clinical value of the cardiopulmonary recirculation is two points. One point, it is a cardiac load. Second point is the high rebound rate after the end of the dialysis session because there is no wash out of toxins from the tissue as the blood goes directly from the heart to the fistula, bypassing the systemic circulation. So the urea rebound could be due to access recirculation, cardiopulmonary circulation, or poorly accessible uh, compartments. Major effect of poorly accessible compartment, example, the phosphate because 99% of phosphate is outside the blood compartment. The second type, which is a very common, is the vascular axis recirculation, meaning that the blood coming from the arterial side to the dialyzer recirculating again through the venous gland. Subsequently, there is more than 20 or 30 percent, or even 50 or 60 percent of vascular access blood flow recirculating inside the dialyzer. The drawback is one is the dialyzer clotting, extensive dialyzer clotting because of hemoconcentration. The second part is inefficient dialysis. How we can measure? We can measure that through the three points will be highlighted here. If you have a high grade venous stenosis, very high venous pressure on the dialysis machine. If you have a very negative pressure in the arterial blood flow length, the misdirection of arterial and venous needle replacement. And it is used as this calculation. Please do that for all patients. If you see that inefficient dialysis, if you are doing a lot of uh, bigger dialyzer, longer time, and still you don't reach the target of the dialysis adequacy, or patient with frequent dialyzer clotting, in patient with very high venous pressure, we have to apply this calculation. We will take three samples. One is the plasma sample, 
one in the arterial sample and one in the venous sample and multiplied by 100. It will in, uh, reflect the percent of free circulation. <laughs> For some of the interest of potassium, for the rebound effect, very, very common. If you have a potassium more than 5.5 millimole per liter pre-dialysis, and it will drop to around 3.5 after dialysis, the rebound will be high because potassium enriched tissue, like red blood cells, the other tissue, will refill the plasma again at the end of the dialysis. So in patient with hyperkalemia presented to the emergency room, we can in induce that by very smooth dialysis with longer period to ensure higher removal of potassium and the lower potassium rebound. This is a typical example of that. If the patient is presenting while potassium around six, it will, at the hours of the start of dialysis, it will reach around 3.7, something like that. But at the end of the dialysis, there is a rebound. In, in order to improve that, we need more longer dialysis to improve the rebound of hyperkalemia or more frequent dialysis or in patients with the resistant hyperkalemia we can use safely in between the dialysis, the cation exchange resonance. So in all the, uh, the past discussion of the, uh, a lot of the diffusion, convection, ultrafiltration, back filtration, all the techniques of hemodialysis, what a clinician should know from that is the dialysis is not, not a simple way. The analysis, uh, surface area is a significant predictor of mortality. I wonder still patients is uh, dialyzed by dialyzer like 1.3 in the adult. Dialyzers commonly are in the range of a very small, medium, large, and X-large dialyzers according to the surface area. Most of patients on dialysis center in modern diet centers are using larger or ex larger dialyzers, and this is fit for most of patients, uh, adults. And using larger dialyzer surface area, you can experience intradiuretic hypotension? No, because the blood volume inside the dialyzer is very small compared to, to the surface area. For example, if you are using dialyzer 1.3, the plot inside the dialyzer is around 80 or 89 uh, or 90 uh, uh, milli inside the dialyzer. While if you are using 2.0, for example, it is around 120. So it's only 30 milli of plot excess inside the dialyzer. So again and again, cooler dialysis is important. The dialyzer construction is composed of two parts, the head arterial part and the venous part. The blood coming from the blood side to the arterial side towards the venous side. All through this are inside is the fibers or the hollow fibers or the, the hemodialysis membrane. The usual number of the uh, fiber inside is around 10,000, maybe more in very big dialyzer, reaching 14,000 of uh, such fibers. Design should be perfectly, and we have to focus on one of each of decreasing the hypersensitivity reaction by proper, ensure that the nurses do proper dialyzer priming because dialyzer priming from the inside and the outside removing a lot of particles 
that's called spallation and improving the performance and subsequent urea reduction ratio. Wetting the dialysis membranes. So, so priming should be at least applied for 10 minutes before patient connection, usually in the range of 500 milli or 1000 milli of normal saline, removing the air particles, and this proceeds for more. So what is the ideal membrane for the uh, dialysis? It should be pi compatible, more friendly, less thrombogenic, optimum ultrafiltration that we need to use uh, in hemo uh, diafiltration, excellent diffusive and convective properties, resistant to chemical and physical sterilizing agents, optimal permeability profile should allow high sieving coefficient, removing of toxins. So the flux or permeability, ultrafiltration coefficient, blood membrane contact, this is a big word for a larger pool of dialysis uh, membrane. We will discuss in detail in part three and part four of the dialyzer specification for hemodialysis. Again, the physiology and the philosophy and the three pH. This is my uh, favorite slide. I do that we have to link the dialysis physics to the physiology of toxin generation and removal by the dialysis machines to our philosophy and the target for optimum dialysis. Dialyzer membrane from inside should be and outside should be optimum for removal of toxins and the electrophogenicity. Dialyzate purification should be optimum as endotoxin and the other microparticles can be uh, uh, moved from the dialyzate to blood side. One of my innovations property 15 years ago is to make the fibers is not straight inside the dialyzer. This is called microindulation. Microindulation in this very short video, meaning that we all consider that the blood and dialysate should be considered as a path of fluids. Fibers are not straight, so are not sticked together, giving a space for a dialysate to move in between. This improves 7 to 10 percent of solid removal with the specific surface area. So we have more favorite increase without paying cost of larger dialysis. And this is for sure is accompanied by lower albumin loss. The flux or solid, depending on the low flux, high flux, or medium cutoff, the particular, the glomerular placement membrane, we have to stop here because more than uh, this issue, we will have uh, albumin loss. Meaning flux, flux or sieving, it's typically a sieving. If you put a sieve here and you put a molecule inside, that permits the smaller molecule to pass against the larger. For example, if you put 10 molecules from here of beta 2 microglobulin, seven or eight passed outside and two remain from the 10. So the sieving is 0.8. It is a relation between 
molecule removed from the cypress or the dialyzer to what movement, uh, molecule be made. Typically, high flux as a seeding coefficient of beta 2 microglobulin of about 0.8 to 0.9. These are seeding coefficient and different dialysis membrane. If you are using high flux, so you can remove up to 30,000 Dalton. If you are using medium cutoff, you can remove up to 60 Daltons with the high cutoff with albumin loss, uh, usually in high cutoff range more than uh, seven to 10 grams per session. So this is the flux permeability, improving the adequacy, improving the anemia, improving nutrition, control volume overload, cooler dialysate, be aware of the plasma refilling, control the blood pressure, intra and uh, uh, interdialytic, treat any inflammation, vascular access, recirculation, and all of that, providing our knowledge base to do a dialyzer classification and the mortality, and this will be highlighted in the third part of our uh, basic principle, inshallah, in the next talk, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Hisham. Uh... As usual, for this uh, very illustrative uh, lecture, actually to uh, prescribe uh, a good hemodialysis session with a good criteria, you have to know well the criteria of your filter. That's why sure. the basics are very important to, to be notified because you may uh, prescribing a hemodialysis session with some parameters that are not fitting with the dialyzer you are using. So the, at the end, the quality of the dialysis is very poor. Uh, we have to know, uh, yes, the basics first. Then your knowledge base will highlight the uh, and improve the patient outcome by different procedure, like in, uh, choosing the better dialyzer. So this is the basic, I understand the basic principles. I tried hardly. To simplify, it's harder than uh, I, uh, I, I did, but uh, we have to understand at least the principles of diffusion, convection, filtration, autofiltration, uh, all of these items, saving coefficient for uh, later on for our uh, pace uh, of uh, patient improvement quality uh, on that. Yes, that's true. Uh... So, if we have questions in the uh, chat box, we have one question from Dr. Hind. Uh, what is the mechanism of ISO removal? What is the me mechanism of ISO removal? What What is meaning by ISO? What is uh, What is the abbreviation of ISO for Dr. Hind? Isovolemic. What is the mechanism of isovolemic removal? Yes. You mean that if the patient is isovolemic with no excess ultrafiltration applied, if you are using high flux dialyzer, will be obligatory loss of about six liters. <laughs> However, the machine compensates for that by tech filtration. Subsequently, the net ultrafiltration is zero. So the permeability of water of the dialyzer in patients with isovolemic or, hypo or hypervolemic, depending on the dialyzer ultrafiltration coefficient. Yes, thank you. Uh, Professor Faisal, uh, do you have any comment regarding uh this lecture or any questions? I think it's uh, uh, offline. Okay. Um, Dr. 
Faris, I, I, I hope that I, I am reading the name uh, right, is thanking you, uh, Professor Hisham, for this interesting and informative webinar. Thank you for all. Hopefully that uh, it will be of value. I understand that it's a difficult, the principle, but it is the uh, cornerstone to treat patients on hemodialysis. I want to ask you, Professor Hisham, how many lectures uh, are remaining for uh, the basics uh, series of uh, your lectures? It is it usually from three to four, depending on the time. So, so we have, uh, <coughs> one part uh, uh, will follow is the compartmentation okay. and the rebound, okay. and how to understand the solid uh, dragging effect of, uh, from different compartments distribution, and how can improve what is the rebound and et cetera, and how to choose the dialyzer specification. So I think the next talk, will be more interesting for the nephrologist, provided that they understand the principles. Okay, so it is expecting that we have one to two lectures more regarding the basics. Yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you, Professor Hisham. Uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you for the audience. And uh, wait uh, the recording of this lecture to be uploaded on Afran YouTube channel. And see you later uh, uh, in the next meeting. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Excellent talk, uh, Hisham. Thank you, Professor Th Shane. Thank you, Professor. We are uh, waiting for your comments. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I just went somewhere, come back. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank uh, you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you.